Hello, my name is Mark Woodbury Smith, and I am a clinical senior lecturer at the Biosciences Institute in Newcastle University in the UK, and an honorary consultant psychiatrist in an NHS trust in the UK, working with children with learning disabilities and autism spectrum disorder. In this presentation, I will focus specifically on what research has taught us about the interface between autism and the criminal justice system, and more specifically about future directions for research agendas. Now, the interface between autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, and the criminal justice system, or law, is a very big topic. And I have decided to focus on people with ASD as perpetrators, and to a lesser extent, as victims. This bias is not meant to demote the importance of other legal topics, but instead more specifically represents my own uh, interests and my own experience of working with this population and also reflects research that I have been involved in over the last 20 years or so. At the core of my presentation, one of the most important aspects is the fact that whether as perpetrators or victims, people with autism spectrum disorder are vulnerable individuals. My aims are twofold. First, to consider the existing research in terms of both what it has taught us, but also what its limitations are and what needs to change in future research agendas. So secondly, I'd like to consider what research now needs to be done, what the methodology should be, and what the focus should be. Importantly, as discussed subsequently, the research agenda needs to be executed with knowledge translation in mind. So the research agenda needs to inform strategy and policy. The research on unlawful behavior in autism spectrum disorder began in earnest in the 1980s with a small number of principally psychiatrists who described individuals under their care who had engaged in unlawful behavior. There were other researchers that also described a number of individuals detained in medium and maximum secure psychiatric hospitals who met the criteria for autism spectrum disorder. Over the last 20 or 30 years, a lot has been learnt about unlawful behavior in autism as summarized on this slide. So we certainly know that people with autism spectrum disorder are represented in all aspects of the criminal justice system, whether that be individuals in secure psychiatric hospitals, individuals in prisons, and individuals who are within the criminal justice system process. We know that people with autism spectrum disorder may come into contact with the criminal justice system for a variety of reasons, as articulated in the numerous case reports that have been published in the scientific literature. We know that in specific cases, again emanating from these case reports, a direct relationship can be hypothesized but not proven between ASD and the illegal behaviors described. We also know that people with autism spectrum disorder are vulnerable at all stages of the criminal justice process, whether it be due to acquiescence, suggestibility, um, criminal responsibility, and the ability to enter a plea. There are some significant limitations to the existing literature, which means that we can speculate but not definitively draw conclusions on a number of key areas, such as prevalence and etiology. So what are the limitations of the existing research? Well, one major limitation is that these principally comprise single case studies, or at best, small case series, and as such, Although they may describe interesting relationships and do so in some detail, we can never draw firm conclusions or extrapolate from case studies to those with autism spectrum disorder more generally. A further issue is that the researches 
largely cross-sectional. Now, cross-sectional research allows us to measure correlations, but not causality. And if we are interested in some of the factors that may be causally associated with unlawful behavior, it will therefore be important that we carry out longitudinal, longitudinal studies as well. A further limitation is one of ascertainment bias. And what this means is that we know a lot more about people with autism spectrum disorder who are in contact with services than those who are not. Now, in order to be able to compare results of different research studies, it is important that standardized assessments are used, but this is often not the case. This is partly due to unavailability of such standardized measures when um, addressing the questions that we're interested in. But it's also because standardized me measures are not used across different studies. Some studies, for example, may diagnose based upon gold standards as gold standard assessments such as the ADI and the ADOS, where others may use screening questionnaires instead. There's also uncertainty regarding the validity of existing measures for specific populations such as detainees. So therefore, although there may be standardized measures available, what we don't know is whether these measures are valid in the populations that we're talking about. It is also true that research has been biased by the particular interest of the researchers and is largely psychology and psychiatry driven. This does seem to be changing as more recent research has focused on questions such as criminal responsibility driven largely by legal professionals and researchers and other questions such as suggestibility. My final point is the fact that conceptualization and classification of autism has changed quite significantly over time and is particularly important. And I will talk some more about this. Now, in the 1980s, autism was a relatively rare disorder, as attested by the epidemi epidemiological studies published in the early 1990s that estimated a maximum prevalence of 0.6% for all pervasive developmental disorders as they were conceptualized at the time. Now, at the time, many higher functioning individuals, those are individuals who have verbal IQs of 70 or more or thereabouts were labeled as having something called Asperger syndrome. And much of the literature on unlawful behavior often described individuals with this diagnosis rather than autism. Now, although Asperger syndrome is no longer used and instead is included in this broader idea of an autism spectrum, its relationship to autism more generally is still not entirely clear. Also with the introduction of a spectrum, the whole diagnosis itself has broader, broadened, and as such, the prevalence has gone up quite significantly in the community to 1.5% or more. The other point is the boundaries of this spectrum are not very well defined and in specifically in relation to where trait ends and disorder begins. And so consequently, trait versus disorder is often unclear. Now, what we do know is that certain autism spectrum disorder traits may be overrepresented, overrepresented among detainees in the criminal justice system. And there are various reasons for this. Detainees often have a history of having had interpersonal difficulties and trauma, both of which will impact upon their subsequent relationships with others. Detainees may also be rigid thinkers. What we also know is that the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder, sorry, the prevalence of ADHD is high in detainees and also raised among those with autism spectrum disorder. 
So ASD may simply be an epiphenomenon. Psychopathy is another diagnosis that is overrepresented in detainees and in itself is associated with interpersonal difficulties. And some of the traits, both clinically and neuropsychologically, do overlap with autism spectrum disorder. But these two concepts are very distinct. So it's very important not to conflate autism spectrum disorder with autism spectrum disorder traits. Now, based upon what we do know, either through research or anecdotally, and what is still unclear, I believe this, these questions that are set out on this slide are of particular importance. Firstly, what is the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder among detainees in the criminal justice system? These include detainees who are going through the processing stage, as well as individuals that have been convicted and sentenced and are in prisons. And the next question is, what is the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder in psychiatric facilities? So these include maximum secure psychiatric facilities and medium and low secure psychiatric facilities. What is also important is how detainees with autism spectrum disorder compare with non-ASD detainees and individuals with ASD in the community who have no history of contact with the criminal justice system. We also need to think about what the needs of people with ASD are who may be in contact with the criminal justice system and what systems of care need to be in place to protect them, because as I've already said, they are vulnerable in these systems. And a further point that needs consideration is the issue of criminal responsibility. Now, in order to answer these key questions and other related questions, certain methodological factors need to be carefully considered for future studies. And some of these I've set out on this slide. The first point is where appropriate, a shift needs to be made so that we're not publishing case studies or small case series, but instead we are publishing and carrying out larger studies that are longitudinal and that are collaborative across centers such that the sample sizes are significant enough to draw more firm and valid conclusions. As far as possible, we need to use use standardized measures. And if these are unavailable, we need to develop our own standardized measures. We also need to think about all possible risk factors, not only those in relation to autism spectrum disorder, but also the risk factors that we know about in the population more generally, such as trauma, because factors such as trauma will be relevant as, ri as a risk factor among those with autism spectrum disorder, as it is among the general population. We also need to think about the boundaries of ASD in relation to where does autism spectrum disorder end and where do autism traits begin? Because these are two different populations and the risk factors and outcomes and policy development will be different for the, these two different groups. So ultimately what is needed is large scale collaborative research that draws on expertise from researchers with different backgrounds. This needs to be research that is driven by knowledge translation. And what I mean by that is the need to translate the knowledge into policy and strategy and clinical practice. The research needs to be epidemiological it needs to be robust enough so that we do have robust measures of prevalence across different settings, such as secure psychiatric hospitals and uh, the criminal justice system and prisons and so forth. And research needs to be longitudinal because cross-sectional research allows us to measure correlation, not causality. And in order to determine whether risk factors are indeed 
causally related to outcomes. A longitudinal design is the only way we will be able to achieve this. We also need to look at specific groups, such as those at risk of extremism, which I will touch on very briefly subsequently. And as mentioned before, we need to think about, about other topics such as criminal responsibility, suggestibility, acquiescence, and capacity. Now, in recent years, there has been a lot of focus on understanding extremism, a concept whose most broad and consistent definition posits the core characteristic of holding beliefs that are inconsistent with societal norms and the use of violence to support and enforce those beliefs. Now, this is fortunately a rare phenomenon, but its importance in relation to autism spectrum disorder has been highlighted by the fact that some very high, high profile mass murderers have established diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder the Sandy Hook massacre, for example, and more recently, the Toronto van attack. Now, some people with autism spectrum disorder, particularly if lonely and seeking relationships, may identify with outsider groups that endorse violence, such as involuntary celibates or incels. Some people with autism spectrum disorder with low self-esteem may harbor resentment and jealousy towards others. And some people with autism may develop fixations, and these fixations may have a violent focus, and this may result in unlawful behavior. However, despite the importance of this topic and the high profile cases that are articulated on this slide, there is no specific association between extremism and autism spectrum disorder and acts of terror should not be a red flag for this diagnosis. To finish then and summarize, research must be predicated on the need to further our understanding of unlawful behavior among those with ASD in order to most effectively impact policy and inform service development. Achieving these goals will require a, a truly collaborative effort between experts from different backgrounds, along with consultation with patients, their families, and frontline criminal justice system staff. Given the enormity of this task, a sustained program of funding is needed. Thank you.